regardless of either their hobbies or just everything is Chinese. Um, so speaking from myself being an East Asian native, it's always uh, important for me to don't forget to make sure that when I teach the survey, I have to bring in uh, all parts of Asia. And I think that students have diversity. It's good complicated for them to think about if you know how many languages there are in Asia, how many religions, how many regions, how many countries. They, they, they may resent that, but it's important for us to do that. So I think that's, I don't know if it's stereotypes, it's the obstacles of bringing in Southeast Asia into the classrooms. Uh, because that also has, has to do with high school education. Japan is probably uh, Southeast Asia is Vietnam War. Um, so that's all the American history of narrative is, is taught. You know, overwhelming emphasis on political history. Um, on the other hand, in terms of culture, um, they were just a little bit about maybe Confucius. They brought up a little bit Buddha, a little bit, um, and then the Tang Dynasty, the Golden Age of China. That's the history curriculum of the of the high school and middle school. I don't think anything about Southeast Asia um, before before the 1970s. So I think. Yes, it's a societal problem that our students are not more well-rounded or um, well -made. particularly sad for students who are third generation removed from the, I have Filipino students who have never heard of Jose Rizal. They have no idea, absolutely no idea. Even though we have Rizal Day and so on, but it's just something that's quite alien to their, what they want to be now. And I, you know, so I think they should know about living in Hawaii at what, 3% Filipino? So I think they should know who was it was a result. Um, so I think it's, it's when you're teaching, it's particularly for teaching Asia, right? If you, you know, if you have students who, uh, it's not that you know what's good for them necessarily, but I think it is great heroes. They have people who do great things. I think it's a shame when people don't know about that. Ask Judy about you do of course some violence, right? So this was sort of coming back. How, how do you how do you not leave students with the impression this is these are the signs where people kill each other? Where there's violent? Well, you that class. Well, the only uh, I, I use the movie S21, and we read David Chandler's book, which is also called S21, and we talk about that place. Um, but the most of the examples are from other, other parts of the world, not just from Southeast Asia. So you end up, and in fact, um, David Chandler's book, one reason it's so interesting is that the, it's talking about S21, this horrible torture and execution center, but there's a running, uh, part of which takes place in the footnotes, but some of which is woven through the text where he's making all these comparisons. And he's talking about Argentina, and he's talking about Stalin, and he's talking about Mao, and he's talking about Paris and North Vietnam, and it, that it, by the time you get to the end, the question is clearly, you know, it happens everywhere, and, and you're faced with the position of, you know, if you'd been a 16-year-old boy who'd been plucked out of Dagaio and dropped into S21, then what would have been the same situation as those young men in the movie? You know, if I hadn't done it, I would have been killed. You know, but <laughs> depressing class, though, I have to <laughs> She's going to come out of it every week. Shell shock. Is there whiskey for you? <laughs> no, but I should. Do you follow it up the next semester with a class that moves? Right. <laughs> well, the, the last section of the class, uh, uh, we talked about the NIU shooting. We had a mass shooting. In uh, 2008, and um, there's a book that's been written about the, the shooter in that case, Stephen Kaczmierczyk, and we uh, did a phone conversation with the author of the book uh, about writing the book, his experience writing the book, and then the reaction to the book, and, and how he, he was just, the part of what he wrote about was access to guns, and after he published the book, he was hounded by the gun lobby so extensively 
be that he was essentially run out of his home, his he's moved to New Zealand. He just so he's angry and bitter about the reaction to the book and about American society and the students. So that was the sort of final final stage of the class. Some other culture that really is important. What we're doing. I mean, it's, the classroom itself is like a cultural bridge, and you've got people from the American side, and they're standing on the bridge, thinking maybe I'm going to go across, but it's easier just to wait and see what comes from my side. And then often the professor's in the position of being like a customs agent. There's all this stuff to come across the bridge, but you can't let them be inundated because you don't have time for that. Right? You can't give them all of this history. So what are you going to give them? You know, you, you only give them something so you're editing it down. And I guess one of the ways I've approached it, especially in doing talks where literally I have one session with the group. I'm not their instructor for a semester. So I've got one time I show up on a campus. And it's one thing to learn about another culture, but how do I get the group to engage cultural others as those from whom they might learn? So not learning about, but learning from. And that puts the burden on me to try to elicit from the group what would they find interesting enough to take the bite where I'm not pushing a string at them, but it's something inviting they grab and start to pull. And then you can have a conversation about it. And that's not easy. It's not easy at all. But I think it's something we need to consider and keep in the background that it's not just this let's talk about Cambodia or Thailand or Laos, Buddhism or Islam or whatever it is. Something from these others. You know, I just wanted to share um, a thought. I, I, um, I teach a sociology course on things of race and ethnic relations, um, which you know can be just sort of a high scale of American panethnicities and ethnicities and to try to keep it from becoming that step out of the student's way. <laughs> be the troll at the bridge. And the tools I try to collect from students um, are exercises that place them in the position of creating some of the knowledge that they're going to, to get. And it doesn't work for everything. Um, but just as we've been talking, one of the things about a lot of the stereotypes that I you know, very introductory level students is that the stereotypes that they hold don't come from their encounters with people of certain groups, but rather from media images about the people of <laughs> those groups, or about the people who, or about some kind of weird kind of media um, invention about people of <laughs> these groups. And so, um, so one one exercise that I have students do is um, to identify. A image in the mass media, um, whether it's about you know U.S. immigration, um, and then and they have to bring evidence um, that sure, where did this where did this controlling image come from? How does how does it become a stereotype? And and how can we then you know look at it in a more nuanced way? And it, it isn't a perfect exercise, and and it's not something we get to spend a lot of time on. But it's interesting every semester. To Controlling images students identify, um, what they bring. So, you know, it's you know, kind of this is an exercise that starts on the open web and comes back to the classroom to, to get kind of tooled a little. Um, but you know, letting students kind of letting them off the hook in a little in, in, in some ways for the stereotypes that they or, or you know, kind of letting them off the hook for having created these stereotypes, but on the other hand, encouraging them to kind of craft a more analytical relationship with these stereotypes. Maybe maybe someplace that something that could, could work in a lot of different disciplines. But even sometimes when you've got a platform fairly I mean students who kind of understand and move sense, I think it's very good when you've got blogs and the internet. Something appalling when you 
see what people are willing to say anonymously on the internet about other cultures. And it's horrifying. And it's horrifying to students as well who don't think like that and don't meet people a lot of the time who think like that. So I think there's a lot of, I mean, especially for people like me for, you know, using, incorporating the internet into teaching is something when you've come from a chalk and chalk tradition. <laughs> it's, it's, it's important to do that because that's, that's where people learn is the internet. That's the kind of stereotypes I think. They don't even watch the news very much, you know, they just look at things on the, on the internet, they don't read the newspapers. So. <coughs> I was, I'm trying to formulate a question. I don't know yeah. what you're saying and I'm just wondering how what any of you might think because um, you know, you, you all have been in this business for a while, and uh, the kind of um, the evolution of social media has come about since you've been doing this. So, if you have any thoughts about your early list of, you know, the suspicions that people might have of you, you know, CIA, religious, you know, missions or something, you didn't mention journalists, and I'm thinking, you know, is there, um, I'm not sure how to put this together, but. Um, is there possibly a question about somebody who maybe goes and in investigates or looks into or wants to learn about the culture that you're saying, wanting to use that to bring it to like them, the media, use the media? And then I guess I'm wondering how does something like social media change the formula, the dynamic? I mean, um, I'm just thinking of who is uh, sort of Indian American, grew up in Africa, worked in a bank, took a sabbatical, and is now traveling around Southeast Asia, actually. And she's posting <laughs> all over you know, Facebook all the time, in different locations and visiting different temples and doing all kinds of things. And, um, and I think, like, I'm sure that there's a lot more of the story that we'll hear when we see her again. You know, but we're getting stuff from Facebook and it's been kind of interesting. One of the things that strikes me is this, you know, single, you know, third something woman who's going to traipse and all over Southeast Asia, just like visiting all these locations. And that's kind of, um, I don't know, I wouldn't really have thought that that would be possible or what that would actually be like. It would have been interesting. I don't know if that's even a question. I'm just wondering, but has social media um, come into this? Is it, or is there too much of a language barrier among the Side, but the, the, the traveling there side, we were having a discussion about field schools and, and getting students to reach nothing be and getting getting them to go and, and I do run schools in Southeast Asia. And if you get students to physically go there it can just change their lives. I I'm in this profession because I went as an undergraduate on a study abroad program and I was gonna be a lawyer. Um, and there are some programs too where you can get people from Southeast Asia to come
So does that move into the 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 manuscript of today, the, the online um, at all? Do you do you use any of that or? I, yeah, I've created a couple of websites where I show how manuscripts are painted and read and uh, you know imaged so in, in, in context of that. So you can see videos of them.
And there was recently a uh, bad of um, have you guys seen some of the channels two part sort of take on Surrey Line the second and Jai Line the second. Like documentaries that they they're like a year old now. It's got a lot of
three parts of manuscript. It's a manual on war, a manual on uh, the body, and a manual on theology. And that's the core manual where it's supposed to show different uh, uh, strategies. Yeah, it's good to hear. Affordable right there. Yeah. Why? Right, because my friend. <laughs> <laughs> that always helps, doesn't it? So, but you know, um, but you know, the real manuscript just looks just like this. Even they, they even did the cover. That's exactly what it was. 